Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello out there, and thank you for listening to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. It's free, and we would love to have you as part of our community. My guest today has traveled all around the world, cooking and learning. Graduate of Joliet Junior College, he has attended culinary school in Germany and in Asia as well. And that is only part of his culinary school story. And so without any further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome Chef Adam Roy to the show. Hello. Hello, Colin. Thank you again for having me on. I really appreciate uh, giving uh, uh, all various uh, professionals and students this platform to talk and to learn and to grow together and share wonderful stories. Ah, well, thank you. So I know we have a lot to get to. So let's start at the beginning. Is it true that you started in the industry at age 12 washing dishes at a local restaurant? Yes, it is. <laughs> probably wasn't a legal. Uh, probably was. I uh, definitely was not legal at the time, and probably still is not. Um, I, we have a small nine nine table mom and pop restaurant down the street. It, it's since closed, but uh, the uh, the owner uh, accepted younger staff to help her out uh, do things. My parents. Uh, made it very clear if I wanted a lot of toys, uh, <laughs> I would have to go my own route. And uh, coming from humble beginnings and starting out as a dishwasher for a year taught me a lot. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I started as a dishwasher as well, and I'm sure many of the listeners out there did. That's where we all, a lot of us began our careers, and it's a good place to start, right? It gives you perspective. Definitely. Okay, so you started in the restaurant, you got the bug, you got liking food, and where did it go from there? And how did that lead to you going to Jolie, Juliet uh, Community College there, the culinary program? How did you get to culinary school? Well, I, it wasn't really a passion. Like I said, I was I was involved with other, I was a soccer player, I was a drummer for a rock and roll band. I had many, many things going on at the same time when I was such a young age, and I kind of just did it for the money. There was not a lot of passion. I was bake, uh, at the age of 13, I moved into the head cook position because it was I was probably the only reliable dishwasher that showed up on time, that <laughs> stayed over time. And, and again, anybody listening, everybody knows the more opportunities that you're given is because you were more reliable than somebody else. So that's a huge takeaway, I, I feel, for the for the entire um uh, industry experience. And uh, so I did that for about three or four years, uh, took a, uh, concentrated on the music aspect of it, um, took some like, you know, quick service restaurant industry experience for a couple of years. And then my, I wanted to go to Cornell or Michigan State. I did a couple tours and I realized that the budget just wasn't there. And uh, Joliet Junior College is only about a 15, 20 minute ride west of here. I could work, I could go to school. Their schedules were very, very adaptable and, and flexible to the industry. So I needed to continue to pay for my own schooling. So my mother kind of pushed me in that direction to say, hey, why don't you go to JJC and take some management classes and maybe take a few culinary classes? And um, I did, and I, I was planning to go actually to the front of the house because I, I came from such a rough upbringing for a three or four year experience already in the industry. I said, I don't want to be a cook or a chef. It wasn't as glamorous as it is now. So what it led to was uh, taking culinary classes, falling in love with the culinary classes there. Great program. So originally you were going to go for hospitality. That's why you looked at Cornell and, and the other schools. And then you ended up doing the culinary. And that was because of your mom? Uh, yeah, she she was the one who kind of said, hey, it's a good idea to go that way. And I, I agree with her now. <laughs> At the time, I was kind of half in, half out because coming from a dirty old restaurant or like a horribly run managed thing, you know, we get, we start out at the bottom. You also see the bottom sure. and the bottom of the barrel is not as glamorous as working at a nice restaurant up, <laughs> up in some beautiful, beautiful uh, setting or whatever in upstate New York or California. It's not the same in the South suburbs of Chicago. So tell us about that first day there. You go into school and you signed up and you're not a hundred percent 
sold on it yet, but you're going. <laughs> and uh, what's going through your mind? And 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 tell us about the, the other students that you're with and, and the instructors. Kind of walk us through a day in the life there at that first day, first year. Yeah, at the time, JJC was was still, and it still is, of course, one of the oldest programs in the country. And um, I remember uh, Chef Von Hoff, he was our chef for actually the whole entire, my entire culinary school uh, period at that time. And he started listing on the board, got everybody involved. We were about 50 students, uh, probably split into two classes. There was all ages, you know, um, second career generation kind of going through their second phase of life. Um, some adults, of course, uh, younger students hospitality students that wanted to go culinary so it was a very diverse group of kids all different backgrounds it was a very affordable program and that was another reason why a lot of us all choose it mm -hmm. it was it's a state school lots of scholarship opportunities and um, so chef von hoff that day uh, listed on the board of the entire kind of roles that the chef has to play and i think we filled up like three chalkboards wow and and I think the next day, I I'm sure we lost twenty percent of the staff of the students because they were scared so, of the jobs. Or they didn't... Oh, <laughs> people people thought they were going to become some some TV chef or be like an executive chef as soon as they graduated. He put a he put an immediate stop, which is probably not good for business. However, but reality speaking, the <laughs> yeah yes, yeah, I mean of the school I, actually they should have told everybody to stay. But it, it you got to talk the truth in a culinary school. You got to tell these kids. Hey, if you go to the CIA and you have zero working experience as a chef in a hotel, I would never hire you. I'm sorry, as a, as a sous chef, or I would hire you as a comey, but I wouldn't go up to the level. I don't care where you graduated from. If you don't have experience, you got to learn a new language. Mm -hmm. It's a culture. It's a it's a it's a dialogue. It's it's a it's an action. It's an attitude, and that. That takes time, you know. So again, after he listed everything, we and I think at the end of the two year, three, I, I did it about two and a half years, uh, three years, because I had a couple breaks, and um, I think we wound up with about sixteen students out of fifty at the end wow. and the beginning. So, and that's quite common, I feel, in the schooling industry. And now there's more options, of course. So I think students could take it in different directions, but at that time was quite normal. So what was your first lab in there? I mean, how did you how did you do? You had some experience because you had already been in the back of the house. So how did how did that go for you? Yeah, we didn't really do labs, of course, as every culinary school does, the sanitation and other things first. Um, that got us kind of prepped in, but it was always a hands-on experience there in JJC. Um, we got to run our own banquet facility. So we had like, if we had a Wednesday, Friday lab, Wednesday was our a la carte, Friday was our buffet. So it was always nonstop cooking, preparing. We did sausages. We did, we must have deboned a million chickens in two and a half years and uh, pork. And it, it wasn't. It's a beautiful program now. They have a huge fifty million new dollar new building, six uh, six floors, eight kitchens, the cameras everywhere. But at the time I was there, it was more simplified. So uh, Chef Bonhoff took us through all these uh, scenarios, and and every semester gave us. You know, well, it was garmage, it was hot foods, it was mm -hmm. it was pastry bakery. He was a certified executive pastry chef, so he always influenced us as like kitchen baking, baking in the, in the, you know, uh, pastry bakery, more culinary desserts. We did all of our doughs. We did everything from scratch, which he could have controlled with a, with a group of our size. And it was wonderful to be in that actual scenario, not just cooking in a cooking class. We were actually working every day in labs. And that was very key to our success later on in our careers. Right. Is there any class now looking back that you wish you had that they didn't offer? Like, ah, oh, that would have been really helpful in my career. Oh, man. I mean, first two years, I think they covered it, to be honest with you. It's hard to say that. I mean, now modern cooking techniques, I think the updating the programs, which mm -hmm. they I'm sure they've done, sure but they've done, right. not saying not saying that. I mean, I wish I could have, yeah, I wish I could have done sugar work or chocolate. It wasn't my speciality. We had a certified master pastry chef there too, uh, which was unbelievable for its state school to have that kind of caliber, um, not in a private university or private school. So we, we really were blessed. I, I would say entrepreneurship, but to be honest with you, when you're a Comey entering the business, it's not very useful. You lose a lot of it as you kind of go through. You need it later on in your career, but not immediate. So yeah. all the classes that I would think that I would want 
it's it's hard to overload you as a as a two year uh, associate's degree. You know, they gave I mean? you those fundamental oh, courses yeah. that you need that yeah. build the foundation, but nothing more that would just be over the head at the times. So yeah, so. yeah, definitely. I would definitely consider that. I mean, wishes and needs are two two totally different things, yeah. as you know, as an experienced culinary instructor yourself. You know. Did you have a favorite class in there as one that stood out? Maybe because of the instructor, maybe because of the content? Mm, I I liked uh I liked all the theory classes. I liked the cost um, you know portion management. I liked the um menu planning. I liked all this sanitation. Um I realized now how important they were. Um I I really thoroughly though enjoyed the labs because it was just you realize that it was just unbelievable experience. And mm-hmm. that's what we all needed. Whether you were, because most, of course, due to financial reasons, everybody's coming from a different financial background outside of the school. They couldn't always work in a real restaurant under a real chef. They had to work in another industry or another business or another thing. So I think that that was still to not only to the people who were young enough to afford to make four dollars an hour or five dollars an hour it was also there to 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 give the people who didn't have the chance the real world experience right. and that was priceless yeah and i know community colleges are much less wishing uh, i have a i have a community college degree in yeah. hotel restaurant management that i got at university yeah. uh, southern maine community college and Excellent. you know that's a great way to you know someone get into a degree or a career or any kind of training, maybe a little bit cheaper. You know, maybe you want to go to the the Harvards and the Yales or the CIAs and Johnson and Wales and other places, but you can't afford it or you yeah. have to live at home and you can't yeah. spend that dorms. So did you, was it okay? Did you get scholarships? Did you apply for scholarships? Did the school give you grants? I- I think the total price, I don't know per credit, but I think the total price of the two-year associates was about $4,000, which is very affordable, even at that time. Um, I got about $1,000 worth of scholarships. I spent a lot of time applying for various scholarships. So I was... I, got, I ran away paying cash for my two-year degree, and I worked a full-time job. I was a pastry cook uh, downtown uh, Chicago, so every day I'd take an hour and a half train ride one way, hour and a half train ride one back, because I'm, I'm from the far south suburbs of Chicago. Um, I worked in banquet halls. I worked in, in various places through the years of culinary school. So my parallel education or my dual learning at the time was just – it just – accelerated my knowledge and my skills. And I, I read Harold McGee's on, on cooking on, on the trade. I read all the <laughs> culinary fundamentals. I read food history books. I, I was immersed. I had nothing but immersion because I knew I needed to get the biggest bang for my buck. Yeah. And it's so true. I was in the same boat. I had to work all during culinary school, you know, and I worked late nights like a lot of students do. My students do today. And, you know, it's a double edged sword because you're getting that experience and you're getting money that'll help pay for the school. But at the same time, you're so tired in class. You know, you have to yeah, get up early. You have to be there. You have to be doing your best and those reports and homework. I mean, it's it's tough, but it, it can be done. Yeah, then you got to go to work and listen to some dictator scream and hit you all day at, at work. But but that's what you need as a young cook. You need the discipline. It's it's like the military. It's like it, I'm not saying it's at the level, but it it is regimented in a way, and that's that's a good way to learn. And and again, with, with, uh, I was able to keep the JJC schedule to about two and a half days a week. So the other five days, yeah, that half a day plus another four four, I was able to work. And a full-time job, 40 hours a week, and plus the travel time, it, it was hard. It was really hard. Gen ed classes, um, lab classes, theory classes. I did it in a two and a half years instead of two um, because I took a semester off. I could talk about that later. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's, it is it is such a short amount of time. And oh. when you're in there, you don't often realize that. So if there's yeah. any listeners out there and thinking, I can't do this, you can't. You know, hang in there. It's a short two years and you, know, you might have to sacrifice social life and everything else. But do it, get that yeah. credential, and then it gets easier. Definitely. Totally agree with you, Chef. Totally agree. Okay, so you got out of there. What did you do next? What did you, I know you were traveling a lot. So what was your aspiration? <laughs> what did you do? Tell us about that. Well, the semester after I finished all my lab classes and culinary classes, a few gen ed, I took, I had an opportunity to work a summer in uh, the Mount Washington uh, Hotel and Resort in um, the White Mountains in New Hampshire. So I, I did that. However, I got called back from a previous country club owner who was a, a, a 
Greek uh, immigrant. Um, they were established in the south sides of Chicago and they had a, a country club where I worked a short time. And um, they called me because they lost their chef and I always ex uh, expressed the interest to go overseas. So he had a private yacht. The family had a private yacht that they uh, chartered out to other wealthy families and wealthy uh, uh, travelers. So I got uh, I got called back uh, same weekend. I, the day I arrived, they flew me back. The day I arrived, I had to prepare a tasting menu. I did a 10 course tasting menu, which was way over my head, but it, it worked out somehow. And uh, I got accepted to go on. The next day I was flying to Greece. Wow. So what I did was I went to Greece. Uh, it was a private yacht, the customers paid $10,000 for one day. Uh, that's not including the food and not including the gas. Uh, and we were a crew of 10 and I was the only cook uh, or private chef, whatever you want to call it. I, I was 20 years old. I had a suitcase full of clothes and a suitcase full of cooking books. I had a DVD player and a mini speaker and a small galley kitchen where I had to cook for the crew and the guests. And there was a lot of downtime. Uh, it was about two months um, so I was very lucky to to have this experience. We went through the, under the boot of uh, Italy through Sicily. Uh, we went to you know can, we did the whole Gold Coast, Cannes, Saint Tropez, um, um, uh, sorry Monaco, <laughs> Monte Carlo. We did all the the you know Sardinia, Corsica on this private yacht. It was it was wow, amazing. How we awesome! Yeah, we catered for the rich and the famous and the mafia guys and the and, and their their whole crew bodyguards. It was I could talk hours about this story. So the ship the ship actually wound up in. Um, um, Mallorca in Palma uh, near Ibiza and what happened was the ship was put on another ship and brought to the Mediterranean so the Greek owners asked me they said would you like to continue to the Mediterranean and I still had a uh, my gen ed a few gen eds to finish up in um, culinary school and I said you know what I better finish this degree otherwise I might not go back to it mm -hmm. so that's when I got a job as a sous chef at the age of uh, 20 21 in uh, West Chicago in Hollywood Casino under a great great chef, uh, Gonzalo. He was one of the best chefs I've ever worked with. And I was a banquet sous chef uh, doing tons of tons and business, tons of business while finishing up my associates. But then the bug bit again and you had to travel. I know you went Germany, Asia. <laughs> well, Tell us about those trips. <laughs> that, that's another issue is that I, a couple of years before this whole, before I even finished culinary school, I met a German chef who had a connection to the German um, consulate or the German embassy here in uh, in Washington. And he was finishing up his culinary teaching careers. He was from Germany, lived in America for a long time. He connected me to a youth exchange program. Um, Germany exchanges uh, students from the US and um, Germany every year. It wow. was at that time, it was 80, America, 80 Germans for 60 Americans. I think it's 60, 60 now, it doesn't matter. But it was a full year. It was a mini ambassadorship fully paid for by the German government and the American government. It was created in 1986 by Helmut Kohl and Ronald Reagan to build a better bond between Germany and America. So it's two months. You don't have to have any German language knowledge. You can't be a doctor and you can't be a lawyer. You can be any vocational technical trade. There was photographer major, photography majors. There was uh uh, car painters, wow. <laughs> there was auto mechanics, there was agriculture. Uh, I was the only chef. Uh, it was absolutely a German history, German language. There was a lot of people. So we were all different levels, all different uh, states, all different backgrounds. And um, so you got to go work the career over there, but also you went to school too. Yeah, it was it was a full year, two months of language. Um, four months of a vocational school. So I went to a culinary school there and then six months of an internship. So the uh, two months was in the South on the French border. And the, the last 10 months was up in Hamburg, Germany. So I did a vocational school there. It's their uh, apprenticeship program. So I was almost in one third of the year or one third out of three year apprenticeship program. I did a, a one full year of that. Um, and then um, how's the schools in Germany compared to the U.S.? You just came from Juliet not that long ago. How, how is it? Is it different? <laughs> oh, it's it's totally different. They they do a lot of consensus kind of like cohort learning, and so when they took an English class for their vocational culinary training, it wasn't English as in kind of like grammar. It was menu writing in English. It was, oh. it was culture. It was, it was more spread out. It wasn't so regimented uh, as in, oh, you got to learn the grammar. You got to learn this. It was about words, terms, 
uh, colonology and stuff like this. And then of course their lab, we had lab classes, we had outside catering events. Uh, we took bikes over the Polish border uh, for a class trip. We did every, it was absolutely amazing, but it was a lot of theory because their practice was during their, if, if they went to school for one month, uh, six months would be in uh, in their internship. Then they'd come back for another full month. Then they would go back for six months. This went on for three years. And uh, Switzerland does it one day a week and four days working, for example, one day school, four days working. So you learn side by side. It's a complete parallel learning journey. And so when you graduate after three years, you have three years of culinary experience and you have kind of three years of theory, theory learning. So how was your skill compared to theirs? Did you ever like, well, they're hot, more advanced, less, the same? <laughs> did they, you uh, know, did you razz each other? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of competition, but um, we really came together. They ex they appreciated my questions. Of course, I, I we all conversed in pure German language. I had I continued to go to a German language school also at the same time when I moved to the north. The first two months were nonstop nine to five German, but when I moved north, I continued. Uh, to go on because I wanted a certificate, an international language speaking certificate. So my German got better and better and so did my understanding. And I was told before I entered in the program, if you don't study hard and study really, really intense during your first two months, you won't take away as much when you get into the schooling and then of course the apprenticeship. Mm. You know, so that was very good advice. I, I I took that to heart, and that's why I walked away with millions of documents, and and I took notes in German. I, I spoke all day in German. It was really wonderful. Great. Now that was the second of your t culinary training. Now you also went to Asia, did a lot of work there, and another culinary school. <laughs> well, yeah. A quick, real fill in in between that was I, I came I, I came back. To, to U.S. for a short time, and I wanted I de desperately wanted to go back, so I got a job in Zurich, in Switzerland. So working in Switzerland for another year was was just a, a wonderful piece of the career. I worked in a very old classical hotel in Zurich, the Dolder Grand, before they renovated it with all silver and these huge cooking cooking ranges and hot, sweaty kitchens. The really the old school you could you could smell it in the air. It was just wonderful. And then 9/11 hit, uh, business dropped, everything kind of went back. I said, maybe it's a time to come home. So what I did was, is I came home and my Joliet Junior College uh, hired me on because I, I initially said, I want to go again, traveling overseas. And they said, why don't you work temporarily? We just lost our chef de cuisine. Uh, why don't you come and be our head chef for our banquet facility, working with the students and focusing on the business aspect. And you can fine tune some of your skills, maybe wow. help update a few things. It was, it was an excellent opportunity. I actually got offered to stay on and slowly become a teacher. And I, I just had that travel itch, like yeah. you said. But how was that going back to your old school? And now you're the, you know, the reverse roles here. Now you're the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I supported the teachers. I wasn't officially an instructor, but I did substitute sometimes when one of them couldn't make it to work or whatever. But I worked very closely with the instructors, helping them bring in prod products and helping them set up kitchens and managing the crew, the core crew that we had. It was like, it was like, I can't believe I'm back. It was amazing. <laughs> and how the stories we had to share, the, the instructors really enjoyed my energy, having me around. And really, I, I just had such a respect for them because they were all my teachers mm -hmm. just from four or five years ago. You know, it was such a blessing to be there. And um, I, I had that itch. They knew it. They knew that I could. I wasn't going to stay in one place <laughs> for a long time. So I got a job on uh, cooking as a chef de party on Holland America oh. line in the, on the big cruise ships. So we were up to 1,012, 1,600 passengers, and I did that for about another two years. Uh, That's and great. Off. And there's a lot of listeners that are interested in cruise ships. So maybe you could t spend a little time talking about that. What's it like in those guys? How do you get on board? What is the crew like that you work with? I, I think I used a headhunter. Headhunters have probably the best connections to the cruise ships because the cruise ships at, at the time, and I think even pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, they'll always use recruiters. So I would definitely to go through those executive search firms. Yeah. I would even at a smaller level, you're not going to get a, you know, even a Comey position, they're, they're outsourced. Those cruise ships have contracts with the Philippines and Indonesia and India, China. And they don't really hire Americans, right? Because they have to abide by different laws. And yes, stuff. that's true. I think in some situations, if you're a sous chef or an executive sous chef, they might hire a, a foreigner as in a, a northern, a westerner to, to kind of bring some in. But you have to have some experience. 
There could be a lot of other opportunities you get with Windstar and Seaborn, smaller cruise ships where they could take on an apprenticeship, uh, apprentice or either uh, allow a, a, a Western uh, educated person mm -hmm. to kind of come on as a uh, temper, uh, some now, special thing. Now, as an employee, you're not a guest, so it's not as glamorous <laughs> as some may imagine, right? Kind of However, like they do keep the crew very en engaged, entertained. It was not a, I mean, yes, you work every day. You don't have a day off until you're you're disembarked for a couple month holiday. You get all your days off together. They'll fly you wherever you want. At that time, was very good. It, we started a new restaurant on board. It was the first time they started charging for the onboard revenues. So that was the beginning in 2001, 2002, uh, sorry, 2002, where they started to get this $5 surcharge for their fine dining. So we opened their first steakhouse. It was a Northwestern steakhouse, uh, trained over in Seattle for about three weeks. And then we jumped on board and opened up the new restaurant. It was exciting. It was wow. really exciting to be a part of that. Good. So if someone wants to look into it, they could find a headhunter is probably the best way. And Yeah. And yeah. I would uh, Disney. You know, there's a lot of options out there. It depends on where you want to go. We traveled all the way from Russia to Iceland, uh, Greenland. We did Hawaii. We did Venezuela, Can Panama. Can we did everything. It was wonderful. What's the, the life below deck, as they say? You know, what's the cabins like? What's the food? What's what do you do on your time off? Is there a rec room? Tell them about that. I, I'm. I'm sure every company is a little bit different. We were a very Dutch oriented company because it was uh, Holland America. They kept all the Dutch officers there. They kept, kept that Dutch heritage. Uh, kitchen was all Filipinos, which was wonderful. <laughs> what a lovely, hardworking culture and people. And then the front of the house was all Indonesians. So, oh, service was just hilarious. <laughs> we had the Indonesians all across the pass. We were all a bunch of mixed, mostly Filipinos on, uh, inside the pass. And we just nonstop joking, laughing, hardcore, yes, pushing, 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 but there's a lot of coffee breaks. There's a lot of tea breaks. Uh, you can't drink enough 89 cent Heineken's to damage any money in your pocket and you can't spend any money because you're probably barely going to go off board. But it was a good, good experience to see massive, massive amounts of food go through a, mm -hmm. a, an area, three meals a day, nonstop eating. It was just nuts. And were you allowed to go ashore when you docked or you were at a location? I tried. Uh, unfortunately, in Quebec, I, I, I went unwillingly when I had my appendix removed. Yeah. <laughs> Most tourists <laughs> take something away. I, I actually dropped something off in Canada. <laughs> so that's always a funny story I like to, to tell. But uh, you never know the, what's, what's going to happen to you. And um, I tried to get off as much as I could going to beautiful places like Oslo, Sweden and, and Rotterdam and, and uh, Mexico and, and all the Hawaiian islands, even Vancouver. And the St. Lawrence River is one of the most beautiful places. Mm -hmm. If anybody has a chance, the, the New York to Montreal cruises and back are just gorgeous. So we had a, we had a crew member win a hundred thousand us dollars in a, in a casino in Halifax. He was a Filipino guy <laughs> resigned on the spot, but he was a celebrity for a week before he disembarked. So there's so many funny stories that are in, in the, you know, it's a floating the hotel, right? It's, oh, you know, it's, it, it is. But you live there. You don't get to go home and you know, you're all together oh. as a crew. So it was the next step, Asia. Where did how did Asia come into it? Yeah, I I I was still kind of not not. Uh, I was still at like a not, I wouldn't even say a sous chef level. I would say more like a junior sous chef level. How do you get into Asia as a junior sous chef? They're not going to obviously hire you to cook um, Chinese food or Thai food or Singaporean food. So what they'll what you could do is what I what, what I found is I found a three week culinary arts kind of cooking class. It wasn't really a, a full-blown university at the time, but it was kind of a three-week intense Asian culinary arts course. Where was and, that? Um, um, that was in Singapore. Okay. And um, that was at the time they were a new startup school. I think they've developed into a culinary academy since then, proper one. Uh, but at the time it was quite simple. And um, the reason why, I, and of course, I paid probably about the, for three weeks. I paid about the same price as I did for my two-year associates. However, <laughs> they had a six-month internship that was paid at a very, very low rate. So that gave me enough time to knock on as many doors as possible, uh, shove my resume into anybody that I I met along the way to try to stay, and that was the goal. And so going, I planned the Germany trip three years in advance. I, tr I planned the Asia trip probably another two years in advance. I knew I was going that direction. I had the desire, but it took me a long time to put the dots or connect the dots together. And that was directly after the cruise ship, but there was something in between there. 
Yeah, I, I traveled. I took three months. I went to Kathmandu. I, I had a girlfriend in the Philippines. I traveled to the Philippines a lot. I, I went around Asia. It was my first intro to being in Asia. Then I started directly in Singapore. So it was a three-month um, uh, good introduction to Malaysian, Singaporean, Thai, Indian, uh, Vietnamese cuisines. Uh, it was nice. It was a certificate course. And then, we, and then I moved to work uh, under one of the most famous chefs at the time, Chef Sam Leong, in a 25-property uh, uh, restaurant group. So they had all, it was fine dining Chinese food, if you could imagine. And uh, everything was Western plated, but prepared, uh, of course, in an Asian kitchen. So I did uh, dim sum for two months. Uh, I wrote down every recipe. I took a million photos. Uh, I did uh, Chinese vegetarian for one, uh, one month. It was zero garlic, zero onion, zero, of course, meat products. It was a Buddhist vegetarian um, a diet. Uh, then I did one month of a Thai restaurant uh, cuisine, and then I did another month of dim sum because I loved it so much. And then the last month I did uh, Chinese barbecue and um, wow. uh, banquet. So it was yeah. a full six month uh, intense training. And I, Chef Sam was one of the best. His teams were so talented. And he said, Adam, you can go to any restaurant you want. Just let me know in advance so I can make awesome. the arrangements. It was a blessing. It was a blessing. So there's a lot of stress in our industry, especially, you know, people work and getting burned out. Is this how you prevented that by all the travel or what, what was your advice to somebody? <laughs> oh, I, I think I, I think I topped up on top of the stress because it's, you know, not only being in a foreign country and, and, and listening to a foreign language and learning how to take the subway or the bus or, <laughs> or, or paying for, I mean, it was every day you woke up and you're like, okay, what's going to be the adventure today? Just crossing that, that, that street to try that different food that you've never, you don't even know how to order. And you're just pointing to people's dishes on a neighboring table saying, I'll have one, I'll have two, I'll have three. Different currency. Like how much is that? One uh, of these. <laughs> yes. However, you know, I, I really have to say that it, looking back, it is so similar in, and I've worked in 10 countries full time, not just visiting, but 10 full, 20 years overseas, 10 different countries. And I think that it is so similar to what we have in the U.S., the culture, the, the language, the, the misfit sometimes kind of jokes, pranks, camaraderie that cut that stress uh, uh, a lot, you know, and I was also very lucky to always have good contracts where I always had at least a month break of holiday, maybe not all at once, but throughout the year, I always had vacation, always had weeks on weeks there, I would just go somewhere and just let it all out. And that's what I, I suggest, not only to the professionals or the educators, or the students across the board, pretty much that everybody should take time to to kind of think back, reflect on, on what we learned this year, what you're planning, how to regroup plans for the future, and also just be with friends and family, mm -hmm. learn, you know, grow as, a, as an individual. I, I think that it, it's possible. You just got to plan. It, it's not easy if you try to do something tomorrow, but if you plan a year out, you, you can do it. And I think most companies understand that. That's, that's what's kept me sane throughout all these adventures and travels. Okay, I'm going to take a quick pause right now and ask you, the listener of this episode, to sign up for our newsletter and mailing list. I left a link in the description, or it may be even easier just to go to www.chefroach.com slash contact. That's chefroach, all one word, dot com slash contact. Then just go to the bottom of the page and sign up for our newsletter. It's free. Then once you're signed up, you'll never miss out on our latest news, announcements, episodes, contests, course information, or exclusive deals. So go ahead, sign up so you can get all of the information and more through the periodic email updates. And don't worry, you can always unsubscribe if you don't like it. The link again is www.chefroach.com slash contact. So go ahead, do it now. We want you to be part of our community. And if you don't do it now, you'll probably just forget by the time this episode is over. So just hit the pause button right now and take the 15 to 20 seconds to get it done and then come back and hit play. We'll wait for you, I promise. Okay, hopefully you just did it or you've already done it in the past or at the very least, you'll be doing it very soon. 
Your support of the show and the network is very important to us, and we thank you in advance. All righty, so now back to the show. So did you skip any steps in your culinary career, have any regrets? Because you did a lot. <laughs> you know, uh, as, as you know, and, and talking to professionals and your professional career and everybody, we all, we all wish we did something here and there, or we wish we kind of went back or I went the banquet chef route. I wasn't so much an, I, I was an a la carte as a comey and as a chef to party, but I wasn't so much as a chef to cuisine in my own restaurant, creating my own cuisine. And not every chef gets to do that, which is okay. You know, that's, that's not everybody's deal. And that's also, it's hard to do sometimes. Um, so what I did when I got to a, a company later on in my later career, probably around 2009, I was able to be a, a chef in my own restaurant as the steakhouse chef in a foreign country, which was even better. You know, chef to cuisines and up usually get foreign contracts or foreign packages. Uh, if you're below a chef to cuisine at a sous chef level, they'll usually take on a local talent for, for those positions below. But I was lucky to still be an executive sous chef. However, run my own a la carte restaurant for two full years. And that was something when I got to an executive sous chef level, I could have kept on going up. But I decided to delay the executive chef promotion to take on a new role where I could go back and revisit that step that I really wanted to do. And I wanted to be successful at, too. Mm. Good point. Um, so it seems like culinary school was the foundation for all of this, you know, the story of your, your career so far. Looking back now with perspective, do you, do you have any regrets? Was it was it worth it? Was your return on investment? Do you wish you went to a more prestigious school? Is it is it what you thought? Um, I, again, I, I I I would never talk uh, down upon any culinary uh, school experience, whether it's a certificate, whether it's a full on apprenticeship program, um, any chance where you get to take time to focus on studies or parallel learning, studying and working together is, is priceless. That's the best way to learn. Um, I, myself, in my financial situation, I come from very humble beginnings. I'm very happy that I was neighboring, yes, <laughs> a very good, well-reputable uh, school such as Joliet Junior College. Um, if I had the money, would I have gone to the CIA? Probably. If I did come from that background and I didn't mind if I had to pay for it and I had the means to take on debt, sure. I'm glad I didn't because I have more freedom and financial kind of uh, uh, flexibility now where I didn't need that in my life. But would that have excelled my learning? Probably. Um, I did at the time we we didn't play with caviar and lobster and filet mignon, but in in many restaurants you don't get that chance anyway. So it was more practical learning at a junior college level. I'll never I'll never downplay the junior college experience. I, I actually think it was more personal, more intimate. I I constantly bombarded my chefs and instructors with questions after questions, and and I do say this anybody in any experience and life in general. As students, especially in the culinary world, if you don't push your bosses and, and light a fire under their behinds, you also won't get as much back. So I, I always encourage, we, we in, uh, one quick story in JJC, one of my friends had a, um, or my fellow classmates had an uncle who went, uh, uh, got a venison in Wisconsin. And we asked the chef in, uh, in school, we said, could we bring in the, the whole carcass and could you teach us how to do it? Because we didn't, we didn't have this in our class. And he did. Our chef on a Saturday, we invited <laughs> the entire class. Only the four who initiated this conversation showed up, unfortunately. And we totally deboned, we processed a full carcass. Mm. We made T-bones, we did gloss de viande, we did sausage, we did French garlic venison sausage, we did, we did, uh, we did everything. We did uh, cured hams, we did everything with the entire uh, uh, carcass. And that was just priceless. And a, and a certified executive chef was standing next, Chef Vanoff was standing next to us the entire time showing us because we pushed him. You know, and it was he he respected this and any chef or any passionate leader would respect this from their staff or students say and they would also get excited and say, oh, you want to learn? So, yeah, I want to do this, too. I want to get involved. I want to I want to do this myself. I haven't done it in 20 years yeah. or whatever. So the, the instructors or, or the leaders or the, the executive, they get involved, too. They love it. So yeah, it excites it, them. it's. Yeah, it's a two-way street, you know, it really is. And it's it's kind of a win-win for the students and the and the chef themselves, you know. 
Yeah, and schools, no matter where they are, are just the foundation. It's what you do afterwards, you know, and, and travel or go, go out to a caterer, do a personal chef. It's what is your career? What do you aspire to do? And set those goals and go after them. And the foundation is, you know, it's it's everyone's learning julienne, right? Everyone's yep. learning basic yep. saute. You're learning a lot of the same <laughs> yeah. skills. Yeah, and, and tournay, you don't use too much, but I was lucky to learn it. And in Germany, I practiced it every day because they still had dishes where they tourneyed potatoes. And and again, that that at the student age or in the college uh, or university setting, it's all about exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you expose yourself, when you open your mind, you might not use every tool in the toolbox every day, but at least you have that tool in the toolbox and you could revisit it, pull it out in the future and say, okay, I, I know how to do this or I know what to do with it, which is great. Yeah. Do you think you're a better chef or hospitality professional because you worked overseas? Do you think it added to your skill level, your, your, your portfolio? I, I don't I don't think I, anybody has to travel. I don't think that it made me a better chef in general. But what it did do is it opened my eyes to a bigger world out there. Um, I'm a I, I don't even consider myself a foodie. I consider myself a, a food psychopath, if, if that's a new term <laughs> that I could introduce to the world. I, I'm beyond the foodie situation. It, it, food is definitely always going to be center plate. I'm always going to be proud of my chef experience. But what took what took a, a advanced kind of interest later on was culture. And I, I speak four foreign languages now. I have friends all over the world. I, I was exposed to some amazing cuisines and I, I feel proficient in some of them, in, in some things, but learning a dish is, is not gonna get you a, an executive chef job or make you a better chef. However, learning more and in, in-depth in and different skills will lead you into a different pathway. And that's what, it, what, what the difference of traveling and working overseas was. Everybody says, wow, you're an amazing chef because you worked overseas. No, there's amazing chefs here, right here in, in this wonderful, beautiful country of, of the US. So and true. You don't have to leave your borders of your town to, to be a good chef or a good dishwasher or a good hospitality manager. It depends on what you do with it. And nowadays with the internet and all the resources that we have, it's, there's no excuse not to grow every day. You know. Right. So what's what's next for you? Where where is your journey going to continue? Where's your goals? <laughs> what's your plans next year? Next two years? Five years? I uh, again going back a little bit to to Singapore, having that time and that 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 period of knocking on doors. I it led to working in Thailand for three years. Uh, I joined a five star hotel company that and working in Oman uh, in the Middle East near Dubai uh, for a couple of years as an executive sous chef. I moved to Malaysia. That's where I was a chef of, a, of that award winning steakhouse that we won a, a national award for. It was wonderful. Then I got promoted to an executive chef in China, worked in China for about five and a half years. And then uh, in the ancient city of Hangzhou in the old Manchurian capital of Shenyang, the home of sauerkraut and the home of white kimchi, as they call it. Yeah. And then uh, leading the Chengdu, the home of Sichuan cuisine. And then um, after realizing it and working for that company for about 10 years, opening hotels, uh, uh, getting exposed to some amazing theories and concepts and, and having 130 cooks under my, under my uh, supervision, two secretaries sometimes, everyday challenges, uh, dealing with, you know, all these various things that, that I didn't have to cook anymore. Of course, you have to manage more. So um, that led me into teaching and uh, uh, stopping at that company, going back and earning my bachelor's and master's online in, in uh, FIU at Florida International University, doing it the entire time while I'm still uh, in a job teaching culinary arts. So I was yeah. lucky enough to get a job in South Korea teaching uh, culinary arts at a university there while doing my bachelor's and master's full time. It was amazing. So that, then I worked, went to Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai was another training school uh, that I was involved with, a hospitality culinary arts training school. Then I came home, uh, pandemic. Uh, so what happened was, is I, I started planning out other things, uh, re retuning, find fine-tuning some certifications and some further education. Uh, my goal is to continue as a culinary educator. I think I have a lot to bring to the table to any culinary school, any hospitality school. Uh, I like teaching hospitality theory classes, management classes, even uh, food safety and uh, re real revenue and purchasing management. Uh, when you come down to the basics that, that kind of you learn in the industry that so many things that I skipped over in school that I, I'm able to now 
pass on that experience through education to students all over the world, wherever I am at. So my goal is to go that way, possibly earn, like yourself, very inspiring to earn a PhD or an EDD in education in some kind of career in technical education. So my goal in the long term is to secure a future in education, which, which I'm very excited to do. And you think that will be here in the United States or it could be anywhere? It I, obviously with the with the online trend right now, it, it could be anywhere. I, I do hope to teach at the same time to always do some parallel learning so I could implement some of my um, doctoral classes, uh, real world, uh, actual real world while I'm still in it. Uh, I think that that would be the way to go, whether you spread the program out or whether you do it as fast as you can. I think that having that that resource of implementation or experimental or just cohorts kind of sharing while you're on site in a real real world educational situation, that's the way to go. But I'm very, very proud of my industry uh, experience. And I think that that's, that's a, that was priceless uh, as if I just stayed with uh, that, that temporary teaching job at JJC yeah. so many years ago, I would have missed all that. And, and, and I still say, any path is the right path as long as you're happy doing it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do what I did. I just like to share the stories to because maybe it does help you make a decision to go somewhere else or go further or do something different today. That's that's the whole point of well, not only with the credibility, but now you have so much more to give. You know, so much more to share with the students, and you know, just you know, bringing that vividity, you yeah. know, that stories, that that life experiences <laughs> yeah. to the classroom. Of course, of course. Yeah. Having a lot of energy and, and, and being a personable uh, individual uh, wanting to share. Uh, I don't have any egos. I, I'm not a, a Michelin star chef. I never claim to be. Um, I think that the best chefs to work for are the chefs that are working and trying their hardest every day. If I go for an interview, I interview the executive chefs I worked for when I was very young saying, what can you teach me? Not just well, how, how much money are you going to pay me? I always yeah. thought about it as an education, a continuing education and getting paid for it. It is a life skill. It is a, it is a trade. It is a, it, it, we are skilled laborers. We are trained. We are individuals with various experiences that are uh, irreplaceable and we can not only save money, we can make money and we can manage for all aspects of, of an operation. And, and that's what, right. that's what real chefs do. And especially if you educate yourself further and you don't stop. So speaking of education, what advice or guidance would you give to a new student now? Like if they asked you, well, should I go to culinary school or should I enter this career? What should I do once I graduate? Where should I go? Or what's my career path? What advice or guidance would you give to someone like that? I, I, would, I would always say that, that, of course, in the current situation, everybody feels that there's no hope and there's, there's, it's, it's never going to come back. It will. It'll come back differently, but it'll always come back. It's people are not going to stop eating. They're never going to stop uh, not only being interested in food, but experimenting themselves. In the old mentality, people thought that if they taught somebody a recipe, they wouldn't come back to their restaurant. However, they, they learned differently that, that they would come back the next week and ask for another recipe. So they, they, it, it builds interest. It builds, it builds all these things. I, I would always say as a student, this career will never stop paying back. Whatever money you put in, you will get triple in the future, whatever price you paid. So it'll always, and, and the options that we have as, as young cooks, as, as, as experienced chefs, all different levels, we have options. We have options galore. It'll, those resorts are not going to be knocked down tomorrow, even if they're not that full today. They will always continue to stand. So don't be discouraged by the current thing. Right now is the time to learn, grow, re regroup, re-strategize. If you're in the middle of your career, maybe go back to learning, uh, add value to your career. Students, to get a unique selling point, what makes you special? Is it your work ethic? Is it your experiences? Is it your diversity? What can you bring to the table? And I, I think it's all about attitude and, and, and commitment to that, to that uh, facility or that, uh, that establishment. I, I would always say that never frown upon anybody who's learning also never frown upon people that don't want to learn we we need the soldiers uh, to do their jobs too everybody doesn't want to be a chef in this industry and that's fine if you want to be a cook if you want to be a dishwasher that's great 
you know, we respect you for it. As long as you try to do the best, the best job you can with that experience and, and that, that work ethic, I think that's, that's respectable. I always thought, oh, why wouldn't that person want to get a promotion? Why do I have to do all the work? Why do I have to push, push, push? Well, everybody has a different uh, social situation. Everybody has a different financial situation and that's okay. I've learned as I've grown older that, that that's okay. I, my path was not somebody else's path. So true. And I, I respect it. I respect Good it. advice. So what about guidance and mentorship? That's big, you know, mentees, mentors, and putting that together and helping those that are coming behind us. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, from a, from a student's uh, perspective, I, I would say not everybody wants to be your mentor, which is fine. Uh, some people are busy. Some people have a lot of things on their plate, family, personal, professional growth, whatever. So you got to kind of fish around and see who's going to be a mentor. I, I suggest it to everybody to get one, not only uh, students, but myself, I, I need a mentor as making a transition from the industry into education. It's always nice to have friends and people to bounce ideas off. Uh, current educators such as yourself, Chef Colin, to to give me advice on, on diplomas and pathways to grow further. Sure. Um, I currently uh, at JJC, at Julia Junior College, I offer every year a, a mentorship scholarship uh, through the school. Um, it's, a, it's a financial and I, I take it a step further. I didn't want to just, you know, offer money to a student for who probably needs it, uh, but also to a student who probably needs the advice. And I always keep a door open through email and also through uh, guidance to kind of say, hey, chef, how do I do this? Or, hey, chef, what did you do? Because my path ways might not be for everybody. However, they might be interested to find out or shop a little bit of how to do that if I was to want to do that. And I, I think that that's fair. I, I always try to give demos and give speeches when I come back to to my hometown, of course, in the south suburbs. I always offer to to give uh, um, uh, demonstrations at, at Joliet Junior College, where I'm a very proud graduate. I think uh, we'll put that a, a link there. There's a small interview in a bio of, of me giving a pork demo last year in March. It was so much fun to work with the pork board and the, the ACF chapter, where I was a proud uh, at my proud beginnings uh, there as a junior member, and then later a, a full-time member in the, in the ACF chapter there. And um, again, we all need help. Everybody needs help. And, and the internet is sometimes not enough. You need a, a person with experience or person with passion to help you through these challenges in your career, because it is very common to jump every two years, three years, one year sometimes. It's okay to take a temporary contract somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's okay to find role models that, that work uh, in the industry that hopefully will give you the time of day. They might not dedicate years to you, but you might be able to buy them a coffee <laughs> and, and have a 30 minute chat with them. I, I would, if anybody approached me, I would do the same, not only to people I, I offer the scholarship to, but to anybody who reaches out, I'm, I'm happy to, to share moments, share stories. Um, I might also ask reverse questions of how, how can you advise me on something? <laughs> you, you never know. It, it's, it, we all learn together. The, the student teaches the teacher and the teacher teaches the student. So true. So if there's someone out there listening that may be starting a culinary path or has some more questions about Asia, or maybe even a teacher that would like you to be a guest speaker in their classroom through Zoom and talk about some of these different experiences, how can someone get a hold of you? How can someone reach out to you? Emails, emails probably great. I, I, I think email is still classic. <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not a great Twitter or Instagram user. I'm, uh, of course, living in China, it's all blocked. So I kind of dropped out of that phase, <laughs> which was great because I was able to focus on things like fermentation and, and learning, uh, uh, growing, eating and traveling more, more so as opposed to staring at my phone all day. Um, uh, email's great. Uh, I, I love giving demos. I love inspiring students or educators or professionals to give them a little bit of a different perspective and a different story. It's almost like a reflection for me too. I can always look back of what I did right, what missteps that I had, things that worked out, even I thought it was a misstep, but it actually wasn't. It, it led down another path. So um, uh, again, I'm, I'm always happy to discuss things. Great. And what is that email? Uh, it's uh, Chef A. Roy at hotmail.com. Okay, and I'll put that in the show notes too. So if anyone's listening wants to reach out to you, they can use that link. And we, we also, uh, me and uh, one of my 
previous secretaries uh, who worked with me in Shenyang, uh, we put together a startup tour to take uh, peop, uh, students or educators or anybody to the old world Manchuria. And uh, that was in um, the Northeast part of uh, China, right on the North Korean border. We climbed the Great Wall. We look over the border of North Korea. It was gonna be a great tour. Unfortunately, last year, everything fell apart. So we skipped last year. We're gonna skip this year again. But in the future, if people wanna sign on to, uh, to this uh, mailing list, I'm always happy to put people on a, a group. So when these tours kick up, uh, during the summertime, we're able to go and see this wonderful birthplace of the Qing dynasty, uh, learn how real sauerkraut was originated there, uh, re really understand what, what the history of this, of this last kingdom of China really was all about. And how do they find out about these tours or how do they get involved? Yeah, well, I, I guess we'll put it in the link. And uh, it's also Chef A. Roy Tours. I have a Wix site. Um, uh, uh, videos are there on me. I have uh, some documents, sample tours. I cut out a lot of the dates because, of course, all the dates got shifted around. Uh, I'm looking to entertain students, uh, culinary schools. It's, it's more like a food culture adventure. Uh, we're not cooking. However, we're eating a lot. Wow. And the things that you get to experience, especially the North Korean cuisine and the, the borderline Great Wall. We don't go to Beijing on the Great Wall, but we do go on the North Korean border, which is 20 times better. Believe me, <laughs> when you can climb to the top of that wall and look over the border into North Korea, you're just like, holy cow, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> Looking at the Yalu River running through on the Chinese Sounds side. Sounds amazing. Course. I might have to sign up for that one. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I did it myself. Of course, I put the tour together just being so passionate. The people are so wonderful and warm. The, the food is so great. The price is so affordable. We were able to get the price really, really good for students that really are interested in a nine day adventure and everything inclusive. It was, it was just great. It was I'll just put impressive. all that info in the show notes too. So if someone's, someone's looking, they can, you know, reach out and find out more info on that. Yeah. Really appreciate it. So as we come to the end of our chat before we're going to wrap up now, is there any last minute advice, any last minute guidance, something you want to leave with the listeners before we end this episode? Yeah, I uh, I want to tell everybody on all levels and anybody in the hospitality industry, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid to jump ship, literally. <laughs> don't be afraid to to take a, take a risk, take a chance. Um, try to be a little bit calculated. It's hard to come across last minute adventures and make a last minute decision. I planned my entire career. Uh, in advance, I had to th rip the paper up a few times in between, and that's okay. Um, but I still had a plan. And uh, sometimes I had a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. So uh, I, I was never afraid if, if plan A fell through because I always had a plan B. Um, I never regretted a moment of not taking an overseas adventure. And uh, I do always suggest that professionals and educators take at least a month. If you can get it paid, wonderful. <laughs> if you don't get it paid, well, sometimes it's okay to take an unpaid leave and put resources back into yourself. And as a student, save all your files, save all your photos, uh, copy your hard drive to another soft copy hard drive, <laughs> carry that with you. I have 500 gigabytes of, of, of files and photos and memories that I can look back at any time. Uh, recipes from culinary school, methods, things that I needed later on in life, not maybe right away. Uh, tools, I say tools in the toolbox. And um, I really want to make sure that everybody just takes time for themselves. You need a breather. This is a hard core, hard stressed adventure in any level of this uh, career. Take time for yourself, you know, take a breather, do something that you want to do. That's not always related to what you do every day. Food is, is a passion. And, and even if you're not passionate about it now, you could fall in love with it later. I wasn't, I was not a lover of this industry, but I am so happy that I took this route and I never, ever had a regret after I realized what it could give back to me. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. I want to first thank you for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We appreciate your time and your insight and your honesty and all of your stories. Thanks. Thank you again, Chef. I really appreciate your time in this platform. I, I think you're doing a great service to the industry and the students and the professionals and all, all aspects. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that as well. And we'll talk again. Bye-bye now. Bye. 
And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.